I swear every day it feels like that thing goes faster. It does. <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller and Brody Works. We have Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. And today we will be going over, well, actually we'll be exploring Floriani Total Control Use Software. Total Control Software. Mm. You it. might be a level. I don't know. This is, now I'm wondering. Um but we'll be using the Floriani software today. We'll be going through and uh, just showing you guys some stuff. Uh, before that, we'll go ahead and catch some comments here. We have Cindy Evening, uh, Cindy King saying, good evening. I have a dinner engagement. Y'all have a great time. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Cindy. We have Letty joining us. Good evening. Good evening, Miss Letty. And Woody Sherman. Sure would. I'm having trouble with names today. Um, hey, Woody, how's it going? We have Miss Ramona McKee watching on her tab. But let's go ahead and jump into it. I'm going to share my screen. Unless Justin wants to share his. I don't have it open now. That was the face I was expecting. All right. So we announced, was it last Tuesday? Yes, it was. All right. So we announced last Tuesday that we're going to kind of go over the software a little bit and that we were selling it. And we announced last Tuesday that we're selling the software. Today, we're going to go over it a little bit. Right. Good thing this is live and I can't like go back and edit it because this <laughs> is be my fifth take. Um, so we have the software open here and the user interface. Actually, it's pretty interesting because there's two user interfaces. Um, if we reset the... Uh, the workspace, this is kind of the original interface, which has our object properties up here. Then we have our sequence view here. But if you come up to this little icon right here next to the properties box and you go to FTCU2, it will open the software. And now it's kind of stacked side to side, which I really prefer, um, especially I think now a days where everybody has a larger monitor. It's right. a lot nicer because you have the real estate that you can set these to um side by side so that's my first tip i guess um for because ramona will say hi to nikki hello and ramona says show me specifically the node placement um ps tablet so one of the nice parts is that right here is kind of our um all of our tools are available right here we have them up here in the menu as well, but uh, the majority of the tools that you're going to need are down here for kind of your everyday digitizing. So we've got our select, our text. Under this right here, we have our digitizing tools. Um, so we can go, we have our run stitch, we have a steel. We have our art tools right there, shapes, and yep, um, our 3D view our font editor, save, and our settings. So if we want to do just like a run stitch, we can just come up here, click, click, and then node placement is fairly similar. You've got your left click uh, to place your nodes, and it's actually control click to do a curve node, um, which is a little bit different than what we're used to. Right click actually ends an object. So if you're digitizing and you want to end the object, doing a right click will do that going into our settings and we can go into our shaping tools here 
If we want, we can go ahead and close our line. Or we can split it, and it'll ask me where, and I can split the line. But for the most part, we'll just be joining lines, I guess. Um, it also has these features here. So when you select something, a lot of the tools that you need to do commonly are available right here on this window. Like if you want to nudge an object, you can do so just by tapping these little arrow keys right here. Um, if you want to go into Node Edit, you, that's actually a selection right there on that to where you can just grab it. And I shouldn't have double clicked. There we go. Got the node. And we can go in here and we can edit our nodes individually. See, double clicking added nodes. <laughs> that's why there were so many. <laughs> um, but we can go ahead and select those. Uh, we can drag on a line and it'll curve. Uh, we can also use the little handles. But all of that's available right here. We have our right click. We can copy it if we want to. Right there, we can lock the object if we're done digitizing it. So and one thing one thing I've noticed with the software is they're they're really good at having everything kind of right there where on the objects that you're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the softwares I, I work with, you know, they you can position maybe your your toolbars and whatnot on somewhere in your digitizing area, but you're still going back up to an icon or you know a function to go to the next function, do, you know, edit a function uh, when this one has kind of, you know, depending on what clicks and whatnot, they're kind of all intertwined into, you know, staying focused on that one little element, which is very, very cool. Uh, so you're not back, especially when you have that big screen, like Jeff mentioned, you may, the distance you may be traveling to try to go to, to different menus and stuff, it, it, it can be pretty cumbersome, but, um, yeah, that's one thing in Floriani I've seen that's that's really cool. Yeah, and I think it all just comes down to, you know, do you want to spend your time searching for buttons or do you just want to spend your time digitizing? Right. And making it all available, especially on this uh, interactive toolbar right here, makes it really nice. In fact, sometimes I have to look for buttons when I need to not use this interactive toolbar. Um, the other thing that they did really, really well is they made it easy, very easy to... Uh, convert between stitch types. So if I want to do a satin stitch, I can just click on this line and it'll ask me for a stitch angle. Um, if I want to do, oh, that's an unfortunate. <laughs> there we go. If I want to do a complex fill, I can just click on here and it'll convert it to a complex fill, which 3D view. Maybe that's a little bit too large to see. Let's shrink her down there a little bit. But converting between the different stitch types is really, really simple. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> um, and we can do so with these little icons down here. We can do a fancy fill, motifs. Um, we can also save our presets, which is something else that's really cool. So if I really like this fill, uh, I can right click on the fill here and I can save it as a preset so I can get all of my settings the way that I want and I can save it as a preset. And then when I want to apply that to a shape, I can again, right click on this and I can just select that preset and it'll automatically apply those um, settings. So that's something that's really, really helpful. Uh, but today we're going to kind of go through the motions of we're going to bring in some art. And we're going to load it as a backdrop, and then we're going to show you how to scale it uh, based off of a reference line. Um, and if you have any questions, please make sure that you uh, drop them in the comments there so that we can grab those. So to load a backdrop, I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to go to Load Backdrop. Um, we can also do it with the Backdrop tool here if we just click on this little toolbar. And now we've brought in our art. Um, when you initially bring it in, you can move it around and we can scale it. We have our width and our height here. Uh, even if we select off the image, if we want to go back to it, we can go to our backdrop select tool right there so we can get back to it. Now, if we want to scale it off of a reference line, we can simply right click on it. We can define the horizon. So that would be if we wanted to rotate it, right? If your design's crooked and you want to draw draw what angle you want it to be, 
or we can define the scale, which I'm going to do vertically because this is a really tall design. And it's simply, I'm going to draw a line uh, vertically and I'll let it go and it'll ask me what my requested length is. And it's going to ask me that in inches. So let's go with three and a half and now it's going to scale it. Um, if I was in metric and I needed to go to inches, I could define the scale. I could draw my line here. And then I go, wait a minute, I'm in millimeters and I want to be in inches. I can simply cancel that. And this is probably my single most favorite feature in software period is that I can right click on the ruler and I can change the, uh, I can change it from inches to metric. Um, Cause like there's some software I have where you, if you have anything selected, you cannot change the scale. You have to unselect everything, go completely to just your select tool. And then you can change it from inches to metric mm -hmm. where being able to actually change it on the toolbar like that is really, really handy. Um, but that's how we would load our backdrop and then again, define it by scale. So now that we're done, we can select our, we can hit our select tool and you'll notice that it's not an object in our uh, sequence window. So because it's not an object, it's not something that we can edit. It's not something that we can grab accidentally. We can simply just uh, digitize over the top of it. If it was a vector and we brought it in as a vector, then that would be showing up in our stitch, uh, in our sequence view because vectors is sim is just like drawing with this lettering tool or not lettering tool, this art tool. So if I draw with this art tool, now I have a vector shape and I can convert it to any type of stitch type that I want. So if you bring in a scalable vector graphic, um, it will come in and it'll show up all in your sequence view so that you can uh, convert those objects and then make the edits necessary to them for it to sew properly. No questions yet. Okay. No, not yet. <laughs> so, of course, the next thing that we would need to know is we need to know where our ruler tool is, and that's right there. Um, if you ever wonder what a keyboard shortcut for a tool is, if you hover over the top of it, it shows you. So it says right there, ruler, and then it's got the little R next to it. Uh, and I can click on that, and now I can measure across. And you really can't see this, and it's kind. Of, I'm kind of sad that you can't. But if you look up, I'm right here. If you look in this area when I start to measure, you'll notice that it's it pulls up a little window. And what that's doing is as I measure across this object, it's telling me the distance and then it also has a tip. And for this distance, it's 0.12 of an inch and the tip is to use a satin stitch. So it's looking at the actual width of this item. And it's roughly 2.9 millimeters. And so it's saying, hey, for this distance, you, it would be beneficial to use a satin stitch. Um, if I go out here, we're six millimeters, seven, right around eight millimeters, it'll change the, the tip and it'll say use a fill. So it's, it's gauging that distance. It's saying, hey, this might be a little bit too wide. You might want to use a fill. And if I go too narrow, it'll actually turn... At one millimeter, it turns into a bean run. So that would be a bean is three, right? One, two, three. Yes. Yeah. Um, if I go any narrower, it starts to say, hey, use a run stitch. So for people that are beginning, it's really handy. Um, if you're not quite sure what you should use and when, it's really nice to have that on the ruler tool. Um, but let's go ahead and we can digitize. And I'm going to use the artwork tool. And we can just digitize this J. And if I want to change my input type, it's up here. So I have a line, pen, bezier. I think that's how it's called. And the quick inputs. I can also change those while I'm digitizing with a keyboard shortcut. I tend to pick one and stick with it. So if I actually go over here and I say, hey, I want to use the quick draw. Now it's going to be a right click to enter in a node or a curve node. So it's recognizing that that's the type of input I want to use. And then if I want to end the shape, now instead of hitting the um, the right click to end the shape, I'm going to use enter to end the shape. So I'm just going to come right up here to the top and I'll put in that last node and I'll start coming back around the outside edge. 
And so this would be similar to, I want to say it's satin B. Yes. To do it like this. And we'll get right there. And we'll come up. And I'm using the shift key to lock it. And we'll come right up there. And then it's the shift C. And boy, it did something weird there, didn't it? All right. So we'll hit enter. And we'll just go and edit the nodes. Not that one. Yeah, it threw that node way wide. So we'll just go ahead and delete that node. We can bring that one up there. I'm going to add a little bit of curve right there. And then I can just tell what I want to close the line. Ramon is asking where the quick draw uh, function was. Input. So up here, you have your slow redraw. So it's a little speedometer. Um, right next to it is where you can change your input type. So when you select a digitizing tool, we can come up here. So if I do that, I can come up here and I can change the input type to whatever I want it to be. So if I want it to be quick draw or a line, I can change that there. So let's go ahead and jump back into node edit. And I'm going to fix this line right here. And we'll just adjust some of these nodes. Move that up a little bit right there. And now I can change it to a satin stitch and I can add my inclinations. We'll come one right there. One across there. And one across there. And I will tell you guys that I actually have this uh, opened in trial mode. Um. I don't know why it's in trial mode. <laughs> it was, I think it was something I set up earlier today. Uh, and so I'm missing some of the options that I'm really used to using, but that would be why. So now I've set my, my stitching inclinations and I can go ahead and finish my object. I can go over here. I can set my underlay. So right now I have a parallel. I can do a contour and a parallel uh, at that width and it would be okay. Um, I want to change that to, let's go ahead and do a green like it matches. So I have this little scroll wheel across the bottom that I can jump through the different colors in the color palette and I can find one. We're going to go with that one that I'm happy with and I can change that. So that's really nice if, um, if you're ever wondering where a color is, like you want a different shade of pink, you can go across there. You can actually, um, apply it. You can search for a specific color. If you're trying to find a very specific color, you can search for that color thread number and it'll pull it up. But that uh, bar across the bottom I'll, will always have your thread chart. I keep waiting for Justin to ask me questions. <laughs> so we'll just go ahead and continue along here. And we'll come right up there. So do you find yourself this type of input for sat uh, satins, what you primarily use in Floriani? It is. Um, there is a classic uh, input. Point counterpoint. Point counterpoint. Um, I only really use point counterpoint when I am not 100% sure of the width of an object. If I already know that the width of the object is is uh, over what I need it to be, let's say to do a sat. So if I know it's all my all of my line width is one point two millimeters, at least one point two millimeters, then I will use this type of input. If it's something that it's like, eh, maybe I'm not quite sure how wide that is, I'll go in and actually use the um, the point counterpoint. Uh, and I do that because it gives me the width of the object. It'll tell me how wide it is as I'm moving. I place my first point and when I'm going to do the counterpoint, it'll tell me how far that distance is. It definitely makes sense because Justin nodded a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so now I want to do a, like a Christmas red. So we'll just jump through the chart here and eventually I'll get over to some reds. Uh, we'll go with that one. And now I'm just going to go ahead and start keep going with lines. And you'll let me know if you have any questions, Justin. 
if any pop up, I'll let you know, and if I have some as well. I will say something that took me a little bit of getting used to is like I want to do a curved node right here. Uh -huh. So if I want to do a curved node, I have to do a straight node. And then when I do my second click, then it'll curve it. So it'll start curving this set previous line based off of the first line. Now, which node is the curved node then? Uh, this one. The in the middle. Yep. Okay. You're just saying you have to cut over kind of straight. Yeah, and then it will um, it'll change that. And so, that's actually a a pretty significant difference when you're going from doing artwork to digitizing. You know, artwork. You know, as long as your line that you're drawing is is moving at the curvature that you want, you're not having to worry about. Uh, you know, stitch angles and stuff like that and, and learning to kind of anticipate curves and stuff like that. It really depends on where those nodes go. Otherwise you can bind up tight curves. You can bind up the, the thread quite a bit, cause some issues depending on how small the lettering is or how, how small the element is. <clears throat> so the node action affects the line behind. Yes. Yes. I believe that's what we're saying. Yes. So yeah, you're you're almost you're you're plotting the first point as the curve, knowing that the next point's gonna kind of dictate how the curve is set. Yep. So if I come up here and let's say I do a straight point and then I do a straight point and then I do a curved point, you can see how it arced that. And that's something that took me a little bit of getting used to. So again, that's a straight line, that's a straight or yep, that's a straight line. And then when I hold down to put a curve, it'll actually curve that whole line. Mm -hmm. Which is something that's just a little bit different than I would say what I'm used to. Right. Um, and it took me a little bit just to get used to it. So, say like you have a setting, like you have a, a standard uh density and pull comp that you're using for these satins. Mm -hmm. Once you have that setting, everything you digitize after that's going to continue having that setting until you change it. Yes. So right now, um, I didn't put in any settings at all. So I went in, I changed the settings on this object and it gave that that object. But right here, I don't have that setting. So if I wanted to digitize, like let's say I'm going to digitize the steel stitch and I wanted it to be, let's say, four millimeters wide, I would have to change that first. And then when I digitize it, it's going to have those lines. It's barking at me. We'll do that. Start, stop. So anyways, once I set that setting, if I set it beforehand, it will remember that setting. Um, Floriani also has a really cool feature called save to sew. So if I come here and I go down to um, save to sew, it'll ask me what type of fabric I want to do. So I have all of this list of fabric here. So let's say I want to do a cap and I'm going to say a cap that I digitized. I can set it to do new styles. So I can say to apply the styles of a cap where it'll add a new density. It'll apply new underlay settings. It'll add pull compensation and apply all the other settings. Um, and that's based off of the style sheets that they have. So if I go ahead and hit next, it's going to give me a little four screen thing. <laughs> I clicked off of it too soon to, to read it, but now it's going to ask me, you know, what file type I want to save in. And I can go ahead and save in the different file types. So let's just go Floriani and we'll do test. Close enough. Now, if I go to file and I go to open and we'll see what the test does. Oops. Maybe we'll wait. 
<laughs> my computer's been having a day. Okay. It says wait. It's just telling you to wait. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything you want to see in specific, Justin. Well, um, just so everybody else knows, uh, our, our plan is to kind of run through the the software in kind of a of a series of um, throughout our next you know few several lives um, and kind of go through the software and kind of show little by little what it does and how it functions, uh, just as if we were training somebody on the software. Um, we'll go from basics, you know, on on how to use the tools and whatnot. Uh, run through the basics and I'm just getting you kind of your, your feet wet on the software, getting into more advanced techniques and whatnot. Um, we're going to bring in different projects to kind of showcase how to implement uh, the everyday tools and, and, and features and whatnot and how to kind of implement into a, into a real life digitizing project. Um, So looks like we just have to maybe technical need, difficulties. Technical difficulties. We just we need a we need a pop-up song that says technical difficulties that we can play. That would be great. <laughs> Please hold. Uh but yeah, uh we'll we'll bring in some special projects and and even um, you know, if we run into a digitizing 911, if that ever comes up. While we're while we're doing this, we can maybe use utilize Floriani to to go through a design and see where we can edit things and improve on the design. Um, I know we we've done that in the past in in Wilcom typically because um, that's most of the time what the software that we're using. But we're we're making that move into Floriani and trying to get that a little bit more into our, our repertoire and using that a little bit more on on lives and our day-to-day -day stuff as well all right so i'm going to run through this significantly faster and first i'm going to change it to inches you didn't share the window yet that would help if i shared the window all right so let's jump down here i'm going to set that to 3.5 inches tall there we go and let's rock and roll. How right, did we lose everything? Yeah, that's okay though. So now we're just doing it in fast mode. Yeah. <laughs> well, you grab questions. Or if you have questions. Fast mode. <coughs> Excuse me. Now that is one aspect of using the uh, the what do you call it the quick draw method. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're using? So uh, I'm not actually. I'm using control click. Oh, you are the you're okay. Uh, so, anyways, the the satin B, what's called in in Wilcom, where you're basically tracing the outline of the object, where you can kind of go down one side and back up the other instead of the traditional point counterpoint uh, side to side. That's usually how satins are digitized in the traditional way. Um, but a lot of the newer softwares have this function where it has the different input uh, ways to, to achieve satin stitches and, and pretty much anything. Uh, you will have to, you know, after you complete an object, you are going to have to add those they're called, are they reference as inclinations in the software? Um, I would call them inclinations. It's basically your stitch angles. Yeah, it's your stitch angles. So because you're not, when you're point counterpoint, uh, depending on where you are pointing counterpointing. So if you, if you point counterpoint, maybe at different levels uh, horizontally, it's actually going to put a, automatically put a, a stitch angle between those two points. So if you plotted two points right next to each other, perfectly horizontal to each other, you're going to have a straight angle. Uh, same with the vertical. Uh, once you're when you're tracing the outline of the object and you're kind of going up and back around, 
it's going to recognize there has to be basically a satin stitch between those two or all those nodes are are plotted but you are going to have to add those angles and um uh it's it's an extra step in digitizing that particular object but you're going to have more control over where those stitch angles are um you know, and it can also help make sure that you're not going to use an excessive number of stitch angles. Exactly. Exactly. So if you're, if I'm going across a complex curve, like this is a really tight curve, everywhere that I would place a node, I would have to have a stitch angle. Right. Um, with point counterpoint. And when you're doing it this way, you don't necessarily have to deal with the point counterpoint. Right. And if you, if you saw there going, going to the top of that, that P, there was, you know, quite a few nodes that he's plotting just to make sure that he's that he's making that curve the way it is, and like you said, the, the point counterpoint. Every time he was making those tight little, uh, that tight curve and plotting all those points to get the shape correctly, it's going to automatically do an, a, a stitch angle there. So sometimes that can kind of bind that area up when he's trying to turn, or even sometimes kind of do two angles that are kind of weird to each other. So it's it's trying to turn it's it's so direction in kind of a, a weird spot in a tight corner so um so there's you know there's a couple different ways to to combat that um unfortunately point counterpoint when you are going around curves like that it's a necessary evil to to make sure that the the shape is correct but if if you're using the input like jeff is you're you're plotting your own angles so you're you have total control there um but if you are using a point counterpoint method, it's definitely your, once you generate the stitches and you, you know, you can put it like in uh, different views to see nodes or stitch angles or whatnot, depending on what software you're using, it may be a good idea just to kind of take a peek and see where those angles that the computer had generated based on your, on your node uh, placement. And you may want to either toggle the, the angle or delete a couple of, angle lines from that. Then we have a question here. So the software is suggestive. Is it intuitive to puff where it will pick elements? It thinks it can puff and change settings for puff. No. No. <laughs> um, There's not an AI embroidery software yet that I've seen. Um, yeah, stuff like puff, you're not only, I mean, the basic difference between a puff element and, and non-puff is the density. Uh, that's that's the, the most basic difference between those two satins. Then you start getting into kind of the fine details and, and the, the lack of underlay that you're using in puff designs. Um, and the kind of the structural stuff that you use for 3d puff designs and breaking news matt's working on an ai digitizing app right now matt enderly that's what he says oh okay i, I was on the wrong screen i could not see any of the oh <laughs> questions i'm like man nobody's talking about anything all right it's called send a design via digitizing 911 and have just jeff and justin do it that's the most intuitive way. There it is. AI at its best. Except you have to try it first because we'll want to see your attempt. Shh. Don't tell Matt. Oh. <laughs> All right. So, actually, I think we went further than we were. Yes, we did. Oh. Well, let's put it in reverse. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going back. <laughs> um, so... Right now, before I was using the R work tool and I was converting it, and right now I'm actually not. I'm using the, um, like you can see, I've got the satin here and the classic satin. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the satin tool. And it's giving me my approximate distance here. Um, that is really cool. It's giving it to me in both inches and millimeters. Wow. Um, I know you can't see that, but I'm surprised it's giving it to me in both. Um, if I ever need to pan, I can just hit the spacebar key and it'll pan for me. Uh, it doesn't do the auto pan, which is nice. Um, cause yeah, sometimes I, I have issues with auto pan. 
I prefer not to have the auto pan on because there's times where you pull one direction too far and it's woo. Yep. You're like, man, I was zoomed in and now I don't know where I'm at. So it's when you're digitizing in the tools, depending on the settings that you have, this actually, um, as soon as I finish that object, it asks me where I want my stitch angles. So it, it follows it up immediately. I set my stitch angles and then I'll right click. And now it wants to know where I want my start point, And then it wants to know where I want my stop point. So when you're digitizing in this type of method, it's already trying to gauge where you're, where you're going to be going next. Um, and once I'm done with that and I've set my start point and my stop point, uh, it goes to right back into the last tool I had. So it's still under um, that satin path tool. That's the words I'm going to use. Now, do you know if there is a shortcut uh, like Wocom where I believe if you're toggling between say a running stitch and a satin or a running stitch and a fill um you can use the space bar that it will finish one object and it'll automatically go to that second tool and you toggle back and forth kind of digitizing using one tool double space bar and it automatically changes to that other tool double space bar yeah, because I think the first space ball ends the ends the function that you're on, and then oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the second space bar will change it to the alternate tool. That is to be determined. That's my fancy answer thing saying I don't know at the moment, but we will find out. And of course, when I start getting into these smaller elements, I'm going to start exaggerating my line width. And that's where that tool comes in pretty handy where it, uh, when you're measuring, it tells you, you know, what type of stitch, stitch type is suggested to, uh, due to the width. So if, me if Jeff was measuring the width of that really small tail down at the bottom, more than likely it's going to tell you to use a bean or a running stitch, um, but he is widening that area so he can, you know, do the whole thing in a satin. So it's, so it's nice and uniform. There are times where, especially in smaller lettering, you may have to kind of take the end of the letter and, and utilize running stitches and kind of combine the two, uh, do the thicker parts in satin and the smaller parts in running. But, Anytime you can kind of adjust it just a little bit and, and widen those areas to kind of make the whole thing uniform, I think it always looks better. Yep. That's me agreeing. <laughs> I'm concentrating too. So we do have a content, uh, comment. Randall here says the software looks a lot better than my ink stitch. I doubt I could afford it though. If you do, do go to our group, uh, we... We are selling the software now, and there is an exclusive offer for the Embroidery Nerd group. So um, you can check that out. That is uh, advertised in the group. So check it out. It's it's quite affordable compared to the big software names that are that are usually brought up in the conversation for digitizing. So um, in in the commercial digitizing world, Floriani is not that well. Uh, talked about, uh, but the more we're we are using in, in, in getting into it and, and learning more, it is it's definitely uh, a contender to those those bigger names. It's pretty powerful. I will say one of the cool things that um, Matt recently added to the site. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, he set up the Affirm Pay. So it's one of those things that you don't necessarily have to pay for everything right out of your pocket at once. You can um, fill out your application to a firm and go that route. Right. So, yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about because uh, Randall just did ask uh, as far as the financing. Yeah, the financing is going to go through, th through the payment process. It's the firm financing. So um, 
yes, that is there's definitely an option. And Woody's asking how easy would it to be gradient those letters? Uh, I think that's going to get a little bit more into more advanced techniques that we will eventually get to. Um, personally, I mean, there's all kinds of shadows and gradients going on with this. So you're, you're kind of dealing with a lot of different directions to get exactly the way the artwork is. Um, it is kind of tricky to gradient satin stitches, especially when you're working with the thinner satin stitches because uh, typically gradients are, are done using um, multi layers of different threads at different stitch uh, densities. So when you are getting into kind of these thin areas, when you're trying to do those multi layers, it's just going to cause a lot of, you know, bunching up of the stitches, you're going to get thread breaks. Um, so on a design like this, I would advise against it. Um, but it is something that a technique that we could get into a little bit later when we're getting into some advanced stuff. Yeah, it is definitely possible. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's not. It's just how many color changes do you want? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea is, uh, at least for me, when I digitize something, is how long is it going to run on my machine? Right. Because I do charge by the hour. So... Um, the longer it takes to run a machine, the more it's going to cost. And this is, this would be a thing where if I was doing this project, uh, and it, the main goal was like, is it going to be a personal project? Like, am I going to do this for my family or am I doing this for myself? Right. Then I'm going to take more artistic liberties in it. And I'm going to say, you know what? The runtime on the machine doesn't matter because it's for me. But if I'm trying to turn around and generate income off of every stitch that's produced, now, if I put a lot of gradients in there and it now takes an hour to sew versus 20 minutes to sew, now my customer is getting charged extra and they're going to weigh that too. Um, the other thing to consider it as well is that a lot of times you don't necessarily see it, especially in renders and software, but you do have that light and shadow that you get with, with thread and you can change that slightly with the different underlays that you use. Right. So while this like this does look like it's having a light hitting it from a side, if I actually sewed this out and I put a light hitting it from the side, it's also going to show that light and shadow and it's going to give it that kind of that um, faded look. Another thing with fades, um, <clears throat> you know, even if you get the digitizing down pat, if, if you or your end user is going to be uh, trying to achieve the, the, the fade and say they have you know, not that big of a library as far as thread colors and they have red and say an extremely dark red are the only choices. Those aren't going to blend as well as if you have a very similar colors and you have kind of that, that, that spectrum of colors from, you know, a really light red to, you know, a medium red to a darker red to a, a burgundy red uh, <clears throat> using just shades difference uh, is going to so a lot different in a, in a fade or a gradient than two really stark and contrasting colors. Even if it is in the red family, if it's a really light and a really dark, that fade just doesn't work too well. And a lot of times, depending on the size and the design itself, you know, there there's that, you know, red fading into yellow, say, or a gold, like in a flame or something. So now you have reds, you have oranges, you have golds um the thread makes a big difference uh as well as the digitizing technique yep <laughs> ramona asked have you ever successfully created a gradient in the satin stitch yes i don't personally like it i don't think it has the same effect as you see in ink or in artwork but yes i have achieved it and and i think it looked as good as it did because of the colors chosen were uh you know fit that gradient perfectly yeah and that's something that if you use two shades that really complement each other well you're going to get a nice gradient and you almost wouldn't necessarily see it coming to the eye it would be 
a subtle change, but if you're trying to change, or you're trying to go from, let's say, black to red, or like red to just about any other color on the rainbow, right? Um, you're gonna really see the you're gonna see those changes, and it, and it's not gonna have the the subtle impact that you necessarily want it to. Um, or if you're trying to go flat out and make a, a bold statement, you're still gonna see the line gradients because we are working with thread, and thread does have a thickness, right? Um, and there's no way to get around that. So the more colors you can introduce into your blend to make it a softer transition is going to make a big difference. Um, and then that gets into size. Right. Uh, it's so much easier to, to blend something that's really large versus a really small element. Um, or like Matt says, you can just use one of the color reels where it actually dyes the thread right before it goes into the machine. So you get that type of uh, gradient. Put put it this way: if if gradients in embroidery was an easy, achievable thing to do with with proper digitizing, the color wheel would have never been invented. The color wheel is a, a very impressive piece of equipment to get these gradients pretty pretty much mimicking like you do in print, and, uh, <laughs> and okay, Matt. We'll give you the time of day just for two seconds. Yeah, that's, that's about uh, my so-called color reel getting delivered to my new shop. In your so-called office in, in Omaha. Omaha. Oh, your new shop in Omaha. I got it. Gotcha. <laughs> You're moving again. Yes. Dang. We are. <clears throat> but right. yeah, those are the, gra the, the gradient pitfalls in embroidery. Um, Sometimes it can be achieved and, and, it, and it looks pretty good, but for the most part, it is a difficult thing to do. Lot, lots involved. I would agree. Um, so we'll take a, we'll go ahead and take a look at it and I can turn off the backdrop very easy just by hitting that button. And then if we go to do, let's say 100%, that's what it's going to actually look like. Um, well, at least me looking at it, I calibrated my monitor to the software, which is something that I recommend you do whenever you install any type of digitizing software is you can calibrate your monitor. It'll pop up a box and you actually measure the box and you type in the values. So when you do go to a one-to-one -one screen ratio, it is that actual size on your screen. So you, you have a very good representation of what it's actually gonna be. Right. Um, that gives you a good visual, visual, especially when you start starting to get more comfortable with digitizing. You're going to see objects in, in, and you're going to see that if they're small enough to be, you know, a running stitch or a satin stitch, just by a kind of a glance and, and kind of gauging the scale. Yeah. So another thing to note, and this this actually varies between software, depending on the type of software you're using, is we can see here that this looks really good. All the needle, the needle penetrations are smooth and the color looks nice and solid. And this is at one to one. If I zoom in here to 3,200%, that looks open. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't look like there's enough needle penetrations. And I'm not sure of a software that you could zoom in this far and not see a gap. Um, I've actually seen this a lot lately, uh, is where people zoom in this much and they'll go, wait, that's way too open. And they'll come over here and they'll change it to a number let me get my decimal point right. They'll change it to a number where, okay, that looks good and filled. <laughs> and then they'll put it on their machine and it will do a lot of thread breaks. Yeah, and then they'll have a thread break every three stitches. And then they wonder what's wrong. But I did notice I missed this. I completely missed the crossbar up here on this age um, from the beginning. But that's essentially the start of using a couple of tools. We'll go over more tools. We'll bring in some planned art and cover a little bit more on our next live. Um, now I'm reading comments. I cannot talk and do anything at the same time <laughs> or something suffers. And usually it's, it's my words that suffer, but um, we'll go ahead and we'll jump more into the software. Not this week, but next week. Cause we're every fortnight. I love that. I was actually able every to say fortnight. that. Yeah, it's not very often that you can say it's a fortnight, which is every two weeks. 
I, I'm really excited anytime I get the uh, get the chance to say that. But um, in two weeks, uh, we'll pull up some art. We'll go over a little bit more of the digitizing and the different tools that you'll have access to um, if you purchase the software or if you already own the software. Uh, because it is one of those things that you buy it once and you're done. Um, right. They all the updates upgrades are included. So you never have to worry about that cost. Um, I know people that bought the software 10 years ago that are on the latest and greatest version and it didn't cost them anything else. So that is another unique thing about the software is that it's not something that you constantly have to worry about. Okay. Well, are they at the beginning of the product life cycle or the end of the product life cycle? Because, right. um, it doesn't matter where you bought it along the entire arc. You're always going to get the latest version. Right. But, with that, we're going to go ahead and close out a little bit early today because um, not me, but somebody else has to run real quick or run somewhere, but I'm not going to give them a hard time uh, while we're live. So unless you have anything else you want to throw in there, Justin, I can go ahead and close this out. No, I'm, I'm excited to to share more about Floriani and, and getting more into uh, more advanced stuff, some cool projects and, uh, and exploring a little bit more. And um, yeah, if you have any questions about this, you know, you get a know where to find us in the group on the facebook page youtube comments uh you know where to find us so let us know if you have any more questions about the software itself or if you're looking to maybe invest in it uh let us know we can help you out all right and for announcements i just have one and that's justin is going to be teaching at the long beach show in california he'll be doing two classes three classes two classes uh one is a, a shared class that it's a it's an all-day class that i may be teaching with with eric campbell and uh and i always forget his name ah! kick myself i i'm gonna send you a note next time justin pull up the the names it's joe kramer and eric campbell uh we are going to be doing a, a combined class uh which should be an all-day thing we're gonna have a uh, kind of question answer for him at the very end and i am also doing a second class where i'm going to be touchy uh touching base on the kind of the the small little things to think about in digitizing that actually can make a big impact on on your production and uh just the overall look all right so if you guys want to watch that you can or not watch that if you would like to attend and you're going to the long beach show you can register for that where you register for the classes um i highly recommend it i went last last year we went last year it's it's a great show to be at it's really cool to see all the stuff um it's definitely the biggest show that i've ever been to but yeah. as far as announcements that's all the announcements we have um again i'm jeff fuller from fuller embroidery works that's justin our mentor from ja digitizing studios i'd like to thank you guys for hanging out with us and we'll catch you next time thank you everybody have a good evening